The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we gather to cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge. And today we are doing our third series in the sense making sessions that have been led here by Nita Power on love and sex and friendship and men and women. And so far we've covered love. Last week we covered marriage. And this week we're going to be talking about sex. So super excited to see what uh, what Nita will do to provoke us today. Um, so we're gonna do what we normally do, 20 minutes of conversation from Nina to kind of get us going. And then we'll move to Q and A with, with the audience. You can put your questions in the chat. And just so you know, this will be on YouTube. So if you don't wanna be recorded, just let me, let me know if you want me to read your question on your behalf. And with that, Nina, the uncancelable, take us away. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> I think, you know, being cancelled is always only ever being partly cancelled and you come back and probably get cancelled again. Um, okay, yeah, so this topic, I was obviously thinking about it, um, building up, I thought I'd wear my nice sexy evening dress, although I'm wearing a sports bra as well, which kind of undermines the effect. But um, <laughs> I was thinking, obviously, in the context of, of lockdown, the, you know, I think for a lot of people, the absence of sex you know is is very painful we have a very strange situation where we have governments legislating on whether people can meet to have sex you know kind of full-on restrictions and intrusions where, whether we agree with them or not into people's romantic life or sexual life we have I would say a lot of loneliness um, Hannah Arendt talks very interestingly about loneliness in uh, the totalitarianism book and she suggests that loneliness is often a precondition for being very willing to accept totalitarian ideas. So I think in the context then of this kind of um, isolation for a lot of people, a lack of touch, obviously, you know, we're not just talking about sexual touch here, but a lack of being able to hug your relatives to be close to people that you would normally see um, is very brutal. A lot of the work on touch indicates that it's extremely important for um, our well-being as uh, as uh, individuals, um, as a particular kind of animal that we are. Um, so we, we, I think it would be interesting to talk also maybe a little bit about non-sexual touch as well, if people want to talk about that, because I think it's a very important topic. What I wanted to start with, though, was to try to think about the sexual revolution as if it were the French Revolution in a certain way. So to try to think about the different stages of the sexual revolution or sexual liberation as we've come to understand it, largely occurring in the kind of second half of the 20th century. So we would associate the sexual revolution or sexual liberation with obviously uh, innovations in reproductive technology such as the birth control pill and a general kind of loosening, a concomitant loosening of social and sexual mores such that uh, sex and pleasure start to be uh, coupled, as it were, rather than sex and reproduction. So sex, obviously, we were talking about marriage last week, um, stops being something that happens within that uh, particular context. I mean, of course, there were always extramarital modes of sex, and we can talk about historically um, the different ways in which different cultures had sex, you know, something like homosexuality in its current modern understanding is something perhaps like a more recent invention. There's obviously different ways that different cultures um, understood sex. And so I was thinking about if we had the revolutionary moment in the 60s and obviously this kind of carried on and we can perhaps see um, parts of the sexual revolution continuing into kind of apps and uh, hookup culture and a kind of... Um, let's say free uh, relation to sexuality and sexual um, intercourse with uh, random people, um, you know, different people. And we, we've already discussed, I think, how that relates to a kind of consumer model, perhaps a consumer culture model in which sex becomes yet another kind of commodity. And of course we live in a very imagistic and, uh, you know, visual uh, world. 
But then if, if you recall in the French Revolution, you have the kind of uh, overturning of all of the um, traditional norms. You have the executing of the old regime, you have the uh, aristocrats and uh, so on. Um, after that, you have the terror. And the terror is a, a very, very violent moment in the revolution where tens of thousands of people are executed for being counter-revolutionaries of one kind or another. Lots of personal grievances are um, engaged in, in this. Lots of uh, the original revolutionaries are found out to be uh, counter-revolutionaries and all of the kind of original leaders, or lots of them very famously are executed and gu guillotined. So you have this kind of extraordinary um, heightening of the revolutionary impulse. You've had this massive radical social change and then you have this kind of very, very brutal, violent, bloody um, part of it. And whether historians kind of disagree on whether it's kind of a continuation of the revolution as in the revolution will become, will always be, uh, want more, need more kind of um, enemies, if you like. Um, or whether it's a kind of uh, a backlash against it, the revolutionary impulse. But I think if we're going to do this kind of palimpsest of the different revolutions, then the terror could easily be seen perhaps to correspond to something like the Me Too moment in our contemporary um, scene. So in that sense, the kind of extra, the vigilante or largely extra legal punishment of largely men for historical sexual transgressions and a kind of punishment of them in terms of loss of um, reputation, jobs, income, um, and, you know, and very few of those cases were ever brought to court, as it were. Obviously, Weinstein, Weinstein would be the highest, uh, the most um, famous example of, of the person who was. Um, but it kind of went through lots of industries, um, not just Hollywood, but it kind of spread out and, you know, became perhaps we could see a kind of counter revolutionary moment in the sense of the uh, types of behavior associated with impropriety, with sexual impropriety, are now kind of perceived to be um completely inappropriate you know so something that was appropriate perhaps or, or was at least socially accepted uh several decades earlier is now deemed to be um very negative very bad you know and i think um you know it's interesting to think about whether people will behave in different ways you know they'll be more cautious about flirting with someone at work for example if the punishments for for that would be very severe, losing your job, for example. There is an interesting kind of uh, letter from France, in fact, signed by Catherine Deneuve and other um, women, which was very critical of the Me Too movement because they felt that it positioned women as victims, first and foremost, and not as sexual agents, um, not as kind of freely choosing um, sexual beings. And they defended what they called the, the right to pester of men, they said. So basically, they're basically saying that men should be allowed to to flirt with women and that there should be you know not they shouldn't be punished for kind of trying it on as it were you know if we live in a kind of sexually repressed way in which people are very afraid to kind of make any move then that kind of diminishes uh, a form of freedom they were saying in the letter that this kind of not only positions women as something more like children and and Camille Pallier makes this point as well very very well um repeatedly that you know part of what her, her feminism involves is really understanding that women are you know equal in in the sense in, and what that means is that they are also participants in these risky games you know they're not uh, to be protected you know in law or through this kind of vigilante culture but nevertheless if we're taking this kind of historical perspective perhaps me too then can be seen as the the moment of terror and then what comes after the terror in the french revolution is the th the thermidorian reaction right and this is the moment where you have a kind of more moderate um approach a kind of step back from the obviously ever increasing violence in which more and more people are getting accused of not being pure enough for the revolution including the revolutionary leaders you know, and there's a kind of purity spiral, which is a really important phrase for understanding how uh, mobbing and societies um, work. And I think we've seen a lot of this happening in various kind of culture war stuff, you know, that even in kind of knitting groups, there's a very interesting article written about purity spirals that takes as its example, knit the knitting community, which became 
very, very kind of purist. And so you have people who are out competing each other to be as morally pure as possible. And I think when it comes to sex, that's obviously quite a difficult question, you know, because sex is in a way very complicated and it's very confusing. And it has this kind of, um, you know, very multifaceted meaning and quality that then becomes sort of mutable in different social situations and very, very confusing um, for everyone, I think. And a lot of people would see that politics in a way is a kind of channeling of libido. Like there is a direct relationship between um, the form of politics and um, libido. And someone like Wilhelm Reich would be the most, one of the most um, important thinkers in this way, where he tries to think about the origins of fascism in terms of forms of sexual repression. So that authoritarianism is a kind of consequence of a sexual repression. I mean, it's a kind of wacky theory in a way, but you can, I think, easily sort of understand that there is a direct link between libidinal urges and politics. And when you have kind of mass mobilizations, mass movements, that what is being tapped into, let's say, by kind of demagogues or dictators is a kind of uh, is a certain kind of lust. You know, you can rile up a crowd, you can get a crowd to kind of do perhaps terrible things in a mob. Um, and, you know, one of my Iranian friends said in when they had the Iranian revolution in 1979, that there was this kind of unbelievable freeing of desire. You know, people went absolutely kind of crazy, you know, not only kind of in destruction of buildings and things like this, but also in terms of their kind of partying and, you know, sexual behavior and so on. And you see this also after wars, following wars there's usually a lot of um, sex. So the baby boomers in a way, that generation uh, follow that big uh, explosion in births follow um, World War II in the West at least. Um, so the Thermidorian reaction, I wonder, I, it'd be interesting to see what people think, whether we are heading towards that position, which may be something like a kind of re reconciliation. And this book I've been working on about men and male desire, is actually trying to think about what a reconciliation might look like between uh, men and women in the sense of how do we kind of um, move beyond a sort of mutual suspicion, you know, both the sort of suspicion of men that women, or perhaps among some men that, that women aren't kind of playing fair or that they've got uh, other agendas. And I think we've all mentioned this idea of hypergamy that is uh, kind of very dominant in sort of men's rights activist ideas, the, the idea that women are always looking to kind of marry it up um, that they're always looking for like the best man um, and that this is kind of uh, skewing kind of dating and preferences and that this is kind of um, largely unfair on the vast majority of men and I think then also then the other side the suspicion that a lot of women might have towards men and male sexual behavior um, and it's interesting to wonder about what the difference is perhaps between male and sexual desire might be and if we can even kind of talk about it like that without kind of um, entering into kind of very difficult territory and of course we might say well everybody's desire is different everybody has their own thing obviously some kinds of um sexual desire are still very much punished um by most cultures so obviously um sexual desire of children is is generally regarded as completely abhorrent and often um pedophiles if they're in p prison are murdered by other prisoners so the, the obviously social penalties for certain forms of desire ex are extremely high. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't want to say <laughs> anything about the Thermidorian reaction relation to pedophilia, they're separate things, but to, to kind of end on that point for the, about the revolution comparison, you know, I think we have seen kind of in previous decades, though, people trying to push the boundaries of what is and isn't acceptable and, and pedophilia would be one of those you know, obviously societies and cultures make decisions all the time about what is um, what is acceptable. Um, and I think hopefully we might come to something like a more adult understanding about sex um, that, you know, would be better for both men and women somehow that wouldn't kind of treat women as pure victims and wouldn't be suspicious of men, but men might also have to kind of, you know, in a way be more thoughtful about their own relation to sex um, most of the literature would suggest that men have stronger sexual drives than women, and this plays out in the relationship, their relationship to pornography. Um, of course, some women watch pornography, but it's very much more uh, dominated by men and usually made for and by men using women. Um, and 
yeah, there's a kind of question about the regime of the pornographic and someone like Preciado is very interesting on this point. Preciado suggests that we live in a pharmacopornographic regime, which is to say a regime that's dominated by the use of pharmaceuticals, um, hormones, antidepressants, um, the contraceptive pill, um, but also by the pornographic. And these two things kind of go together. Um, it's a pretty, it's a very interesting claim. So Testo Junkie would be the interesting, most interesting text on this, I think, if people want to explore that um, position. Um, I think Michel Welbeck, the French novelist, I think we've already mentioned, but he, um, all of his novels in a way, try to deal with one way or another with the kind of problem of sexual desire and particularly uh, the kind of loser, the figure of the male loser, um, and of course, this relates to the incel question as well. And we've already mentioned men going their own way, male separatist movements. Um, but the kind of the problem or the question of men who don't get sex or don't get the sex that they might want um, or don't have a relationship to it. Um, clearly, this has been like very widely discussed. I think the documentary um, TFW No GF, I think you're screening it, aren't you, Peter or Raven at some point? Yeah. It's a very interesting documentary, um, you know, which tries to look at uh, it, through interviews uh, and is a classic documentary in that sense, um, what it means, what being an incel means and what its relationship to the internet um, is and so on. Um, so it's definitely worth uh, looking at that. Um, and I think I wanted just to draw attention to a couple of things that Michelle Welbeck says through his novels and elsewhere. In that Welbeck makes this very important point where he compares sort of unrestrained economic liberalism to sexual liberalism. Right? And I think we've already discussed this as well. So it's not just the kind of commodification of desire in sex and the selling of sex or using sex to sell things, but he kind of makes this direct parallel between the kind of um, economic liberalism and sexual liberalism um, in the sense that um, it it's a kind of market, right? The sexual market. Of course, some people do see the world like this when people use a ranking system. Um, if you read Neil Strauss's The Game or any of the pickup artist stuff, a lot of it is about ranking and numbers. And, you know, you give somebody a nine or a seven, depending on how hot they are. You collect numbers. It's very quantif quantificatory. It's a kind of a game of, a game of numbers. And, and in that sense, it's kind of completely coterminous with a kind of market logic. Um, and in economics. And there's a really nice quote, I think, from, from Welbeck, which points out the kind of injustice of sexual desire, where he says, some men make love every day, others five or six times in their life, and some never. You know, and something like sexual desire is obviously wildly unfair. So if you're committed to a politics of egalitarianism or, you know, uh, equal outcomes, sexual desire is a massive problem for you, right? It's, I'm, I'm not saying it's unanswerable, but it does pose the question of how would you perhaps redistribute sex, right? Would that even be a desirable or ethical um, thing to do? It's obviously extremely kind of contentious. You might end up in situations where, let's say, as some people have suggested, even hypothetically, the state provide sex for um, people who can't otherwise have it. Of course, this would mean uh, that people might be paid to have sex with people that they don't feel sexual desire for. Well, you could say, of course, this already exists. This is prostitution. This is sex work. You know, you do not need to be sexually aroused to have sex with somebody if your um, des desired outcome, as it were, is for, for money. It's not for the sexual encounter itself. So clearly sex is and can be bought, bought and sold. It is not um, necessarily a, a sacred um, thing, although it can also be that, and some people would very much like to, to keep it like that, particularly um, in the context of marriage, as we discussed um, last week. And so I think the kind of the Thermidorian reaction in the sexual revolution might be something like a kind of calming down, something like not that kind of extreme sex is only about pleasure and freedom and that's what liberty is, that kind of initial phase of the sexual revolution, um, nor the kind of uh, perhaps puritanical, um, you know, purity, moralism of the kind of, uh, you know, the terror, the, but something in between where there's a kind of more gentle way of trying to understand how it fits into everybody's life and what it kind of means uh, and so on. But I think it's going to be extremely difficult. It's a very, very difficult 
thing um, to discuss um, in any case. Philosophers have generally not been um, very interested in talking about sex, although some of them have had a go. Uh, I've already, of course, mentioned uh, Plato, in a way, diminishes sex because it's a lower form of, of love. For him, the higher forms are love of knowledge. You can, uh, through dialogue, reach these higher forms and these higher truths. Um, but sex, in a way, is too much of a temptation. It's a distraction um, for Plato. Uh, you might get confused with the love of a person rather than the love of the good or the love of the form. Um, Kant, as we've seen, is basically thinks that um, sex is uh, using somebody else. I mean, he, it's an interesting question, actually, that the idea that we turn someone else into a, a tool when we have sex with them, therefore we are treating them as a means to an end and not in, uh, as an end in themselves. Um, so in that sense, uh, sex is potentially immoral, always. Um, and, and then it's really only with kind of psychoanalysis, perhaps, that we start to have sex as the kind of field of in inquiry. And, and, and obviously uh, Freud and, and, and everyone else um, that follows. Um, Freud makes the interesting point in the three essays on sexuality, which is brilliant text um, that everybody um, should have a look at. Not only does he talk about kind of fundamental human bisexuality, not meaning that everybody desires both men and women, but that rather everybody has a masculine and feminine kind of side. And we can see this also in Jung, the anima and animus, you know, this idea of thinking of ourselves as in relation to, let's say, activity, passivity, um, these different elements of our being. Freud makes this argument about kind of constitutive bisexuality. It was very, very interesting, very radical um, in the first decade of the 20th century to say this. And he also, in those essays, talks about the fact that anything that isn't reproductive sex, or as in sex that results in um, pregnancy, is by definition um, perversion. So, because it doesn't do any, you know, it doesn't do anything, you know. So, the vast majority of human sexual behavior, whether it's masturbation or sex with somebody else or any of the other forms of sexual engagement, like a kiss, um, would. Uh, you know, in a strict sense, be perverted. So that question of where we draw the line socially between what is acceptable and what isn't comes back again, if we understand Freud's point um, very well. And I just wanted to um, finish by talking a little bit about reproduction, because I said in my tweet when I advertised this, that we'd also be, be interesting to talk about um, having children or not. And again, this is kind of one of these unbelievably major decisions that virtually everyone or most people are confronted with at a certain point in their life. Obviously, some people are unable to have children. You know, there's obviously questions of adoption and fostering. Um, but I think it's it's for, for anybody who's in a relationship or wants to be in a relationship or has a relation to the thought of having children, it, it's something that people have to think about extremely carefully or often at a certain point will do, um, whether they're with somebody else or, or not. And, you know, obviously reproductive technology plays a role here we do you know for some people they can for some women they can freeze their eggs they can kind of delay potentially um, having a child this also seems to be kind of a, a very big symptom of a certain kind of culture that we have um, sometimes people leave it too late there's an obvious question about biology and there's a difference between men and women in this sense obviously men can reproduce until their dying day if, if, <laughs> if possible whereas for women they they can't there is a natural kind of end to fertility um, which does pose the question of sex differently it has to even if um, we regard sex as something purely free and pleasurable and fun and we are taking steps to avoid getting pregnant um, you know there is a kind of difference I think and it, there's lots of people working on how men and women respond differently to different kind of sexual um, mating games and the different kind of mating games that people play and the work of Diana Fleischman and Jeffrey Miller is quite interesting in this regard although I, I have some poetic problems with the <laughs> evolutionary cycle <laughs> the evolutionary biology which I find really brutal but it's um but of course it is in a way because it's trying to explain human behavior and and you know it's very interesting to kind of understand those ideas so I think I mean just on a kind of personal note it's you know I'm in my early 40s you know, I've decided not to have children. You know, I think it's a very, very big decision. Like some no's are bigger than others, I would say. And this is how I feel it. And I think there's always a sense in which um, you, on this, ki this kind of question, if you're interested in experience and you're interested in life and love and so on, 
it's obviously a massive thing. And I want to kind of say that I don't think being child free as as or childless, you know, so that the language sometimes shifts depending on who's making the claim is necessarily for everyone. But I can't say that because I don't know what the alternative is. Having never had a child, I don't know what it's like. And I think it's one of those kind of insuperable uh, constitutive, you know, things. It's like you go one way or you go another. And I think my reasons for kind of um, wanting not to have a child, assuming that I, I you know, physically could, are, are quite strange and unusual. And I, I sort of don't necessarily, um, I wouldn't kind of recommend that anybody do what I did because I think it's a quite sort of lonely and strange path to take and it's not for everybody. And I think there should be kind of more open discussion perhaps about a culture that seems to encourage uh, women to put off having children. You know, I think sometimes for some women it's very um, tragic. You know, it can be very, very harsh um, if they want children and they, they discover that they can't because they're no longer able to. And I think that's something that we culturally should be very um, um, open to discussing, you know, because it's a massive, massive question and a massive deal. And just in the last few days, there's been this meme going around where there's a kind of uh, image of a, of a mother with two kids and it says, my mother at 25 or something. And then it's, uh, and on the other side, there's a young woman drinking wine with a suitcase saying, me at 25. You know, and I think that there's something very, very ambiguous and ambivalent about that image, you know, and I think, you know, we've, we've talked about the shifts and changes in different generations in their approach to, to love and marriage. And I think sex, obviously, it has to also be this kind of question about um, having children or not. So again, I'd be just very interested to know what people think on this point. Wow, that was awesome. <laughs> That was so much. Awesome. Great. And we have some really juicy questions. Yeah, there's loads of them. Wow. In the chat. Yeah. So I think we'll just go back up to the top again. Um, and we'll start with Hal. Mm -hmm. Hal, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, amazing. Yeah, no, uh, no, yeah, no, I'll unmute myself. Um, but, and it's a really long question. So uh, this will take a while. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no. Post May 68, some French intellectuals and really beyond that, some activists on like kind of the ultra left extended the liberation of desire to pedophilia. They signed like all these letters and stuff saying they should decriminalize it. Or in the case of like Daniel Cotton Bendit, who was kind of the revolutionary in May 68 in France, he actually practiced it. To what extent is that is that like the excess going overboard of this versus the current Me Too, which is like a lot of these people have now been like called out because of that? And also, even though the Me Too movement is appearing to dissipate, there is like QAnon has taken up child abuse and sexual abuse as like its main thing. And they've even like linked it to these things. So Jack Lang, who is the culture minister of France, is now like part of the QAnon thing where like they're connecting a lot of it to him, which is just hilarious. To what extent is QAnon, which is seen as something completely different on the other side of the political spectrum, actually a continuation of Me Too? And what does this tell us about our like weird obsession with child abuse as a wider culture right now? Yeah, that's an absolutely amazing question, Hal. <laughs> um, I think it's, yeah, this is really uh, important. I mean, in, in the UK too, we also had this um, uh, group called PIE, which is the Paedophile Information Exchange, I think in the, the 70s, which um, pushed for the lowering of the age of consent. Um, and some Labour lefty people were kind of on board at the time and they've, they've since been very much criticised for that, you know, and I think, yeah, it's a kind of ongoing um, tension if you have a sexually liberated culture, what then are the limits of that liberation? Um, and you can see exactly why, like if the free flow of desire starts to become, well, it goes in all directions, right? So, and some people would say, well, why not this, you know? And um, I think you're absolutely right though, that this kind of, it's it's like at the heart of, when people have ideas about um, conspiracies or, or that groups of powerful elites, um, child abuse or child sacrifice, child murder is almost always at the heart of it. It's all the you know the the idea that this is what elites do, you know that, that that because it's in a way it's the most abominably evil thing that people can imagine. And I think that care and protection that people have towards children. Um, you know, manifests itself then in in imag imagining its total opposite, which would be 
you know, the, the, the abuse and murder of children um, for, for pleasure or whatever, you know, the, the image would be. And um, I, I, I really like your point though about QAnon and Me Too. I hadn't thought of there really being a kind of connection or continuation, however genealogical and subterranean it might be between the two. But I think, um, yeah, it's actually a very, very interesting um, uh, question. I think, yeah. I, I don't know what to say other than that. It's a really good question. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Tal. Uh, Chris. Oh, I'm supposed to read it. Sorry. <laughs> this is Chris's question. Um, Nina, is there reason to be concerned that polyamory cannot accommodate monogamy and traditional values? That people who adopt polyamorous ideology are motivated more by resentment for the current structure than emancipation. Do we have to think more about a post-capitalist -capital polyamory? Yeah, I mean, I, you can see um, some of the sort of anti-capitalist aspects of, of polyamory potentially, right? Because if you give up on the possessive relation to another, it's like you don't own anybody else or you don't own one person, then of course it, it seems like it's kind of anti-capitalist in that sense, you know, that you're, um, freely choosing relations with multiple people, for example, um, you know, which could be perceived as a kind of refusal of the, you know, uh, possessive uh, nature of uh, monogamy. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about that. I, yeah, I mean, a, a post-capitalist polyamory, I mean, I, I think, perhaps it's because I'm getting older, but I think that some, human emotions like jealousy and so on are very, very hard to eliminate. I think, I know that it properly rational poly has ways of discussing and talking about jealousy. I don't, I, I know that it's not off the table. I, I think very few people would pretend that it doesn't exist, um, you know, even when they, they're very uh, pro polyamory. But I think these kind of deep feelings of um, being left out or not being desired or not being someone's favorite person if they're your favorite person are very, very difficult to kind of um, uh, overcome, you know, and I, 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 they are the kind of stuff of human tragedy and <laughs> pain um, in many ways. I mean, I respect people very much who can, you know, practice polyamory in a way that um, benefits people, you know, everyone involved. You know, I think I do think it's possible. I think um, maybe it's Jeffrey Miller again who suggested, or maybe it was Diana Fleischman has suggested that if you practice polyamory, you you have to be very um, careful about it, very clever about it. You know, it's it's not something to kind of do, um, you know, in some kind of casual way. That that actually you have to approach it in the spirit of a kind of rational, you know, endeavor. Um, otherwise people will get very hurt, but people get very hurt in monogamous relationships too, all the time. So, you know, suffering is not avoidable. Cool. Uh, great. We're going to move to Dean. Do you want to ask your first question, Dean? Yeah, so I'll just read it verbatim. Uh, so my first question is about the relationship between sex and love. In his European graduate school lecture, What is Love? Uh, Badu said something like, quote, sex is not the product of love, but love is the product of sex. So I'm wondering, do you think that in order to actually know if we're truly in love with someone, uh, that we need to have sex with them? Why or why not? And how might this differ between man and woman? Um, yeah, interesting question. I love what Badu has to say about love. I mean, I, a long time ago, I translated um, his work on uh, Beckett, and 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 Badu talks a lot about the the type of love that you see in Beckett's late work, like how it is. It's an amazing novel, and um, yeah, for for Badu, we we've talked about the different kinds of love in week one. The kind of you know at least eight different types of love for the Greeks, and how our culture kind of uh, sort of uh, reduces love often to this dominant kind of erotic. Um, idea. Um, I, I don't think you need to have sex with someone to know if you're truly in love with them. And I think um, perhaps a lot of uh, even marriages or, or kind of companionship relationships don't necessarily involve a lot of sex. Um, you know, I, I, 
I, I, it, it's very interesting. What reminded me again, thinking about the revolutionary, the sexual revolution, is also in May '68, the in, in Paris, you know, and then that obviously that spread the student revolutions. That that actually it was triggered by the desire of students um, in Paris to want to stay over in each other's dormitories, which were at that time, um, you know, separate separated. And so, in a way, the the, sex, the sexual desire for um, uh, freely chosen. Uh, love between the students was actually at the, again at the heart libidinal heart of what then became a political um, um series of events so again i, I think that you know i mean I, the, I guess the the second half of the 20th century a lot of the arguments for why people should live together before they got married were to say to see how it is you know what if you've married someone and you hadn't had sex with them before and it was sort of it didn't work or something or it was awful you know it would be you know very very difficult situation so you could see why people wanted to open up in a way and say you know that we should have sex before marriage you know it's it's actually a pragmatic thing to do um and i i wonder if we might though see more of a turn to to more again to more traditional ideas you know uh, justin murphy's obviously marriage uh, dating agency is a uh, is a very interesting experiment in this regard um and yeah i mean obviously there are still some some cultures that practice uh, arranged marriages um and yeah i i think for some people they don't have sex before marriage although it's relatively uh, rare perhaps i mean obviously for some uh, religious people it's it's not the done thing at all um but I, I think I think you don't need to have sex with someone to to know that you love them. I, that would be my qualified answer. <laughs> Great. Maybe it gets into the different kinds of love. Um, all right, Ursula, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes. I mean, you mentioned that Nina also that sex can be a product or can be looked upon as a product or used as a product. And I've been thinking a lot about, you know, how prostitution, the prostitution market, the sex work is happening. It's often precarious situations and we have mostly women prostituting and very few men. And if we just look at it now in a not romantic thing, but uh, just as products and access to something that you can buy, is it just that we have so, man, so much female prostitution because we live in patriarchy? And then it has little to do with uh, how we are as women and how we are as men, but simply it's a much simpler viewpoint to say we are in patriarchy still. And this is why we have female prostitution and everything that comes with it, like the precarious work situations. And now in lockdown, I know a few sex workers who tell me how their business is shut off first. And also it's maybe much more needed. Um, so that, that was a bit my thought. And especially if we had uh, more women in power in the past, uh, if there is any research that leads us to the opposite, like whoever is in power also keeps some kind of access to sex in whatever way, be it through, um, you know, in the Islamic world with the harems uh, that was not uh, with money. So just the, the way it's dominated, the way sex is handled and dominated, that it has to do more with power than how we are or who we are, men or women. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I mean, that, you know, it's, is sex ever about sex? It's, it seems like it's always about something else, right? And one of the main arguments would be that, that sex is about power, um, ultimately, and this would then it would reflect the dominant systems and structures that are in place. I mean, I think we come up against a kind of nature culture clash when we start thinking about, well, what are the differences between male and female desire? You know, if we make a claim, for example, that men are generally more sexed than women or they, they want sex more, is that a kind of essentialist biological claim, you know, or is it a kind of uh, cultural, culturally specific claim? And, and could there be other kind of cultures in which, let's say, um, women's sexual desire was kind of paramount and I mean I think these debates in the second wave were very very interesting between supposed kind of sex positive feminists and supposed sex negative or sex critical feminists and I but I think there was a kind of a, a third way through that which was to say that you know women the feminists were not in any way against sexual pleasure or sexual desire they just didn't like the way that it was um 
being practiced or carried out or, or you know, in this particular patriarchal system, um, which kind of treads a different line, you know, through the, the kind of yes sex, no sex um, opposition. I think there is a kind of uh, danger in the kind of sex workers work line, which is to say, well, if, if sex workers work and then the state runs brothels, for example, so, you know, you have like almost that situation basically in, in Berlin, then if you were unemployed, could the state say to you, well, you must work in the brothel, right? Because sex workers work. And what's the difference between selling sex and, um, you know, being a waitress or anything else? And I think that's a very, very kind of tricky conversation to have. And it's, it's you know, sex work obviously demands and needs protection and specific kinds of, um, you know, uh, kind of regulation and to protect the people who are, are doing it. You know, it's quite a dangerous job in, in many ways. And, um, you know, I mean, one kind of question to ask uh, communists is to say, well, would there be prostitution after the revolution? You know, would it would it need to exist this this kind of exchange, or would we be so in a different relation, different social and sexual relation to one another, such that prostitution would not need to exist? I mean, in the in the sixties, the sexual revolution, a lot of um, you know, there was a feminist made this kind of argument that actually women went from being private property to being public property. You know, that that what the only thing that the sexual revolution did for women was to mean that more men could sleep with them um you know and I, again i think there must be kind of dialectically a third position which is like a defense of new forms of pleasure and love you know that come and kind of escape somehow the kind of commodification um you know and i i don't know if women would pay men for sex if if the system was different i i don't know about this i think it's relatively rare although it does sometimes happen Great. Okay, so let's go to Peter. Do you want to ask your question? Okay. Um, so manosphere types like Artiste, who is influenced by Welbeck, uh, wrote about the sexual marketplace often and how the Pareto principle forms if enforced monogamy is removed from society. Uh, so the idea here is that alpha males, aka the attractive males, have lots of sex with multiple fertile women, while beta males are either getting cheated on in monogamous relationships or they're not having any sex at all, aka incels, MGTOW. Um, curious to hear your thoughts on how true you think this is and how certain political tribes on the left are possibly blinded to this, uh, if it is true, and uh, how collective virtue might be related to being in the right relationship with this desire. Yeah, I think my position on this is that um, it's better for everyone that people are aware of these arguments, you know, that the kinds of arguments that are being made by Welbeck and uh, the manosphere, parts of the manosphere um, in relation to hypergamy and alphas and betas, like to understand what those arguments are in the first place is, is necessary, because I think a lot of women in particular perhaps don't, and, and people on the left don't necessarily understand that those arguments are even happening and that some people are seeing the world in this way. Um, so I think it's a kind of, it's a, it's a very brutal way of seeing the world, right? I, you know, this, this way um, that it's a kind of, yeah, the sexual marketplace, that it's unfair, that there are alphas and betas. I mean, I think we, we spoke in previous weeks about how difficult it is to actually define um, alphas in, in terms of, you know, what it means in the society, because it can't just be, for example, like the strongest man, because the strongest man is, is usually in prison, you know, so there's nothing kind of you know, particularly um, great about being a kind of very, very strong man necessarily. Um, although obviously a lot of the manosphere is very, very into kind of bodybuilding and, and fitness and, and, you know, and I think that's, that's really great. Um, but the, you know, in our society as well, we, it's often the people with the most money, the men with the most money perhaps who have a certain kind of power and status, but they're not necessarily physically the most um, attractive. So status is something very, very, um, confusing and murky in a way I think who who would count as an alpha um it's it's not just a simple question of like physical desirability it seems to me I think there is a kind of idea of obviously like the bad boy has been around for a very long time the idea of the kind of man that heterosexual women find sort of heartbreakingly attractive but 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 he's completely unreliable right um 
and I think some of the suspicion that men might have or some of these men in the manosphere might have towards women is is on, on the basis that women secretly prefer um the bad boy and wouldn't want to settle down or will you know only secondarily want the the kind of stable family guy um and I think that is a, again a kind of conversation that everybody should have <laughs> publicly um including women I you know I, I think it's probably true in some cases I think you know it's we're not completely detached from our biological instincts I mean even if people are taking um contraceptive pills which women are taking those pills they but they do have an effect on desire there, there's lots of research that shows that it has a, a kind of uh, impact on who women find attractive and so on because it obviously dysregulates um, the natural reproductive um, cycle. You know, so it's obviously going to have manifest uh, impacts and it's very interesting to ask what, what they might be. Um, so, yeah, I, how, how true do I think it is? I, th I think it's true to the extent that we should all discuss it and, and think about whether we all think it's true or not or whether whether we would refuse it. I, th I think for most women, they would be kind of appalled and shocked to think that they're driven um, by hypergamy. I actually think it's a kind of very controversial idea for women. I, th I don't think very many women would admit that, that that's how they see people, that see men. I, I think they would say that they love whoever they love because they love that person, you know, and regardless of what, what their status is. Um, but you know, that's obvious. There are obviously cases where women marry up, right? And you could defend it. You could say, well, look, if you're going to have children with somebody, you want to know that they can look after you and your children. So why wouldn't you marry someone who is wealthier? And in this particular society, you could say the wealthiest people tend to be men, you know, and that women will always therefore be attracted to powerful, rich men. Cool. All right, let's go back to Dean's second question, if you'd like to ask it, Dean. Yeah, so this question is about refraining from masturbation and the sublimation of sexual desire. Uh, so the no fat movement has become really popular amongst men because semen retention uh, seems to yield a variety of positive benefits for most men who practice it. While masturbation yields a variety of negative consequences for most men who are addicted to it, uh, particularly if that addiction is also a porn addiction, which it usually is. So uh, women, on the other hand, seem to generally have a healthier and more generative relationship to masturbation. Uh, at least um, in my experience, most women that I've talked to seem to kind of lean towards that. Um, or at least a less pathological one than men do. Uh, and then there's there's a quote by Cadell Last that came to mind when I was thinking about this. Uh, Cadell is one of the authors of the new book, Sex, Masculinity, and God. Um, and it seems to kind of get at the crux of this difference. So it's, quote, man is defined by not woman, but woman is not defined by, or no, sorry, quote, man is defined by being not woman, but woman is not defined by being not man. That's what it is. So uh, my question is, what are your thoughts on the difference between the sec uh, the relationship men have with both uh, masturbation and the sublimation of sexual desire compared to that of woman? Yeah, um, it's a that's a really interesting question. I mean, I so in the book I do talk about the no fat movement, and I think it's. Um, yeah, it's a very, very interesting phenomenon. And having met some men who who have suffered porn addiction, it's absolutely debilitating. I mean, it destroys their, you know, their relation to themselves. It, pretend, it destroys their relationship to other women. It destroys their imagination. You know, it's an incredibly, like all addictions, incredibly compulsive and can be extremely destructive. Um, and I think it's very interesting when you look at the NoFap um, forums, um, that like the 30 day challenge, let's say, like where you don't masturbate and you don't watch porn for 30 days, um, how positive a lot of men really find it, you know, that, that it does kind of um, allow them to see the world in a different way. They don't see the world through kind of pornographic lenses. They don't see uh, women as um, potential sexual objects. And, you know, it's a very, um, you know, clearly a good thing. Like all addictions are um, absolutely terrible. They're very, very destructive for everybody. Um, and 
I, it's interesting. I mean, women obviously have, uh, you know, the clitoris, which is the only organ that is dedicated to pleasure. It doesn't have any other function. Um, I tried when I was doing this research to, to see whether there was a nofap community for women as well. I'm also quite interested in this in a kind of almost like yoga tantra sort of way, right? Because obviously semen retention and non-masturbation has been practiced as an ascetic thing for a long time in different traditions as well. And I wondered uh, genuinely about whether there was beneficial um, uh, advantages for women too, to, and whether this had been really researched. And it was extraordinary. I could really find very, very little on um, non-masturbation for women as a kind of spiritual practice or as a kind of, you know, the equivalent of NoFab. And there, there really, really wasn't much out there. And I'd be very interested if people have come across anything, even just kind of personal um, accounts. And I, so it, it maybe does seem like that there is a kind of big difference potentially between, uh, you know, a, well, of course we're generalizing horribly here, but a, you know, relationship, a female relationship to masturbation and a male one. Um, you know, and you say whether it's less pathological and I wonder, I mean, anything can be pathological. I mean, you know, I'm sure there are women who are kind of compulsive masturbators as well, but it, it you know, it, it definitely doesn't seem such a dominant tendency, right? It's the, the people who've been addicted to porn and masturbation I've met have all been men, you know, and they've really found it sort of life shredding. Um, and I wish I, there were better resources for men to kind of get help. And I think the NoFap forums are very interesting. I, you know, I, I disliked the way in which the left are often very critical or parts of the left are very critical of the NoFap movement. Like they want to kind of suggest it's some sort of like male supremacist uh, movement or that it has ties to white supremacy and I, I just really don't think it does I mean you know whether one masturbates or not is a kind of question for for everybody who's capable of, of doing it so you know I, I think to politicize it too quickly is also a bit of a danger I think if people feel that they're masturbating too much and they want to stop it's good that they have support for it great great Andy do you want to ask your question sure Hi. So historically, does aggression repression foster social unrest? And what I mean is um, both authoritarian and democratic societies seem like, like with cancel culture now, that can lead to things. Is, is this consistent among, uh, regardless of um, governmental structure? Um, yeah, so, so sorry, just to kind of reformulate it, it's saying like there, there's, that there's always going to be a tension between repression and aggression, let's say, in, in every political structure. Yeah, I mean, there's, it, it's interesting, um, there's this concept of libido dominandi, which is the relationship between like libido and power, um, which is again, sort of suggests that in a way, all politics is the politics of desire. And Deleuze and Guattari would kind of make this argument as well in a different kind of way. But it's in a way, libido is a problem for every government. Like there is no easy solution to um, desire. Like you can have a, a sexually liberated society, but then that causes kind of problems as well. Or you can have a very repressed sexual society but then that causes loads of problems as well. Like there, there is almost seems no good answer to the question of how po politically or socially desire should be kind of um, understood and, and, and dealt with. But I think it's kind of an eternal question. Like politics in a way is the politics of desire. It's like, you don't want a very, very kind of angry population that's really, really repressed, right? Because when it goes wrong, like let's say in the terror or the French revolution, the, you know, it's extreme. You have the unleashing of all of these forces at once and it can be extremely um, dangerous. So Edmund Burke, who's the kind of father of conservatism, sees what's happening in France in, and in 1790 writes a book basically saying, you know, this should not happen here. Like that the revolution is unleashing all of these kind of, you know, libidinal forces and it's incredibly destructive. So then the question, if, if libido repressed desire is politically very destructive and dangerous the question would be how to have a kind of healthy society in that sense that kind of permits people to express their desire in ways that you know don't kind of cause harm you know and, and i think our, our sort of the western culture sort of obviously uh is very de deals in pornography and you know pornography is one of the main ways in which you know it's obviously the internet basically is porn and some other things 
you know, and, and, and in a way, that's the decision that these, our societies have made, in a way, um, how to deal with kind of um, libido. And, uh, and again, I think, yeah, the NoFap movement is very, very interesting in, when it does start to talk about how um, not masturbating gives you a much clearer way of understanding things that often people feel very clouded and fogged if they're kind of constantly masturbating and ejaculating that there's something kind of exhausting about it. Um, you know, even where people feel excited or they think that porn is cool and porn should be defended, you know, it's, it's, you know, I think it's much more ambiguous and ambivalent than, than people would sometimes suggest. Cool. Nina, I have a question. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think you're right to point out that sex, like opinions and uh, norms and almost like the kind of metaphysics of sex has changed dramatically over the course of, I mean, the trajectory of any given civilization, but is also different between social groups. It's one of these like highly malleable kind of aspects of human life. And then it's also one of these things that's absolutely inescapable if any given group wants to get into the future, obviously. So there's like this uh, inherently kind of sticky aspect to sex that also interfaces with the culture. And one of the things that um, I've been really interested in is the move recently that I've been seeing in different philosophical communities and even here at the STOA as well, which is about embodiment or kind of like the harnessing of libidinal energy as a ground for speculation about reality, about the world. And what do you think about that movement? I mean, obviously someone already mentioned, Dean mentioned Sex, Masculinity, God, which was a book written by Cadell Last with a few other men. Um, there's like kind of psychoanalytical people who are really into like Tantra and like, you know, kind of extending the idea of the libido as the source of life energy and kind of turning away from this typical notion that a philosopher must be someone who abstains from sex. So what is that? Like what's happening? And are we at the precipice of some sort of shift in the way in which we view sex, but also the way in which we view metaphysics more generally, that mm -hmm. we can actually incorporate the paradoxes inside of sex into the way we think of the world as the ontological question. Yeah, no, that's a brilliant question. I mean, I, I've mentioned Wilhelm Reich um, already, and I, I, it's, and and I really appreciate the comments um, that people are making about um, Taoist um, sexual practices, and also, um, you know, the different uh, types of um, of masturbation, for example, like the, that it's not just a pure release, um, but it, but there's a kind of erotic practice. And again, yeah, these are very very old questions in some ways, but I can totally see why they remain um live questions and and you know obviously Reich had his org orgone accumulators you know you were talking about what if we could accumulate kind of sexual energy in a positive way um, and this was a very interesting kind of idea that you could somehow harness sexual energy and kind of use it to to burst clouds there's an excellent Kate Bush song called <laughs> cloud busting about this uh, about Wilhelm Reich and um yeah I, I I mean I think all of those things are really positive I, I think we have a culture that absolutely um uh you know permits or even encourages a division between mind and body you know it's a very cartesian culture and the idea that you can think and it doesn't matter what your body's doing because thought is somehow separate from how you are physically and you know even in my own life you know i used to be a rare, very very addicted person i was very very unhealthy and you know to have to change my life so completely in terms of kind of getting healthy and and you know actually looking after myself was was a revelation also in terms of how it changed my thinking you know that they're, they're, they're not separable i mean uh, spinoza and other philosophers did understand this that the mind and the body are not separate things they're two different ways of looking at the same thing you know but i think the culture you know generally encourages like a kind of bifurcation that we think that you know that it doesn't matter what our body is doing if we're, you know, we can think 
separately but it does matter and I so I I very much understand people who want to um, engage in positive um, physical and spiritual practices that would involve you know taking care of their body and therefore taking care of their their minds and their and their positive um, you know having a positive approach to energy um, I think a lot of problems come from from not understanding that great Philip do you want to ask your question Hi. Um, so insofar as the fungible atomic individual is conjured by a capitalism empire or Moloch um, to exploit, and against that, the the previous lecture, the, the secret society of marriage being this like resilient resistance to that, I just wondered if there's an anti-capitalist case to be made for like very strongly vitalizing, probably not by like legislature, but like in some way to, to frame that uh, to vitalize a, a, a marital, traditional, or Christian rendering of sex as a like spiritual, actual, one flesh, co embodied, co somatic singularity. So like, I just wonder what's happening in sex, viz like contra capitalism. And then in your like French Revolution analogy, you go from this like liberality, everything goes to the Puritan terror, to then this gentle middle ground, which is sounds, sounds amazing. Um, can you paint a picture of uh, of that third way a bit more, and maybe like like it takes a village to raise a child? Like, what sort of like how do you nurture that that frame for that world that you uh, you paint? Yeah, no, that's a brilliant question, and it was very um, beautifully asked as well. And I, I, yeah, I mean, the third way, in in a sense, I want to preserve what I said about the second wave feminists who were kind of asking many of them asking for a kind of new way of understanding pleasure. You know that wouldn't just see in sex something kind of you know rough and utilitarian and you know that female pleasure could be taken into account in a kind of thoughtful more thoughtful way um and but i totally agree about marriage i think i think the third way the kind of you know the the, the thermidorian uh, moment perhaps the kind of reconciliation would obviously be something between the extremes of the sexual revolution the idea that sex is like drinking a glass of water or it doesn't matter it's completely casual you can do it with anyone you know that kind of total liberation of desire and the kind of, um, you know, let's say everybody has to be monogamous and you can only mar marry one person in your life and you have to have sex with them, you know, which in a way you can see why the sexual revolution was, was what it was responding to. It was responding to tr traditional norms for better or worse, you know, the idea that that's how everybody should live. So, and it permitted a lot of different ways of living as well, you know, that you didn't have to be tied to this one monogamous heterosexual model of, of desire. But the, the, I mean, the very beautiful way you were talking about the um, sex in marriage, you know, the, the, the sanctified sexual relation, you know, and I think when you talk to Christians about sex, they're not anti-sex at all, in my experience. They, they, they just think that sex should happen in marriage, but it's something that God wants people to enjoy and that actually sex is a kind of, um, absolutely sacred um moment you know and i don't i don't uh, obviously for some you know let's say very hardcore christians it might be that you you should only have sex for reproduction or that it should always be um in the name of multiplying but i i i don't think so i, I for most christians i think that it's a, it's seen as an act of love and bonding that is completely coterminous with the love of god and that it is sacred and, and sanctified. And so I wonder, even though marriage rates are very low, and we obviously talked about marriage last week, at the moment, I think there, there probably will be a kind of growing desire for these, the secret society of marriage, as Raven puts it, the, you know, the, the very beautiful um, possibilities afforded by that kind of, you know, commitment and that kind of long lasting exploration with another human being. That, that turns away from the kind of dating app model of, of things. Sweet. Uh, Dean. Dean is really just, has a lot of fertile questions today. <laughs> no pun intended, right? Yeah, of course. Do you want to ask your, your, uh, your next question? <laughs> Yeah, I, I suppose it's a follow up, but now I'm just like thinking about a bunch of other things too. Um, so, but, but I'll ask this one. So, uh, 
I'm kind of thinking about Mark Fisher here in relation to masturbation and wondering to what extent uh, what he calls consciousness deflation uh, that, that men feel from masturbation as such, whether it's uh, it, whether porn is a part of that or not, uh, is purely biological um, or ideologically mediated by, as you say, the pornographic tendencies of capitalist society. And I'm kind of thinking of like Helen Hester's work here as well. It's like, to what extent is it biological versus ideological? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we're sort of talking about that tension all the time in a way, it's kind of unavoidable. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what to, to say about that other than I think, I mean, if people start to feel compelled to do anything, you know, that it's, um, that it becomes a kind of negative thing, you know, that, that we, that human beings are very automatable. It's how we get anything done in a way, like we can turn ourselves into little machines, you know, but then if we acquire bad habits, then we just keep doing the same thing over and over again that it's very very negative and potentially destructive um and i think the that capitalism does encourage those modes of behavior because they they're very very sort of useful not only to be a worker but also to be a consumer you know and that to be this kind of um you know consuming machine you know of the visual or of products or food or whatever or you know drugs or drink and you know that that's we sort of very much encouraged to actually so to take a step back from that in a way re requires a critical view of the system you know whether we call it kind of capitalism you know clearly that's that's <laughs> clearly it is um but we could also talk about liberalism a, a lot of people now are talking about liberalism in much longer terms you know maybe we live in a kind of post-liberal period in which like liberalism because of its emphasis on the freedom of the individual has actually ended up kind of destroying itself you know, that actually what people want is more communities and cooperation and that tradition and, you know, and that to actually for modernity and, and liberalism to destroy all of those old ties and binds, Marx talks about this in the Communist Manifesto, was actually very, very destructive of our humanity as such, you know, and that maybe again, we might going back to the kind of what comes after um, the sexual revolution and, and the terror and Thermidor, it may be that people will, um, you know, start to, I mean, people already live in kind of communities and towns, but, you know, there are lots of these kind of social bonds that people are in. And the family is a social, the family is a, is a small, um, you know, smaller or larger, you know, it's a set of social bonds and responsibilities that are chosen, you know, and I think people, people want that. I mean, totally unmitigated freedom is extremely harrowing for people. It's very, very hard to be totally, totally free, paradoxically, even though it sounds desirable, it's actually brutal. Yeah. How? Do you want to ask your follow-up question? There's one from Adam, though. I don't know if you wanted to do that one. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do, uh... Check. Come on, Nina. <laughs> There was a plus one for Hal's question, so we're, we'll do Hal's as we're getting close to the end here, and then it also seems related to what you were saying. Uh, so yeah, Hal no, actually, it, was, it was related to that. Uh, just cool. what is the relationship between the rise of like e girls, online porn, and transhumanism? And is this like all of a sudden a real issue? How like this is human beings as consumers and also as machines, just this blending of the like natural human flesh bodies and just this mech like the porn and how that relates to uh, the digital or the digitalization of uh, human beings. Yeah, completely. I mean, I think that's exactly what's going on. And obviously, like the first lockdown, you saw the massive um, rise of um, OnlyFans, you know, the kind of bespoke uh, sort of girlfriend experience, um, you know, tailored porn site. Not, it's not all pornographic, but, you know, that kind of uh, virtualization of uh, relations where people would pay to um, mostly men would pay mostly women to um, yeah to to be online and do things um, so I I there, there's definitely a push obviously that to encourage a kind of virtual um, type of sexuality um, I think we again all collectively have to ask what is lost in the absence of physical presence physical proximity real touch um, real sexual encounters you know, what effect that has on the body politic and individual bodies as well. You know, I, I think it's it's a very, I personally think it's very 
miserable and lonely. And I, I really worry about what Hannah Arendt says about the loneliness as a precursor to a kind of totalitarianism. And I think if there is one uh, in the offing, it will be the, the online surveillance, uh, you know, I mean, Great Reset is not just a conspiracy theory. There's a little book, you can read it. <laughs> they propose, you know, like a very, very online life. And I, I as a sort of pagan, I would um, refuse that ultimately. You know, I think it's, I would rather like go outside and hug a tree and um, then have any form of virtual like relationship. <laughs> Even the Zoom thing is, you know, very complicated to do. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's a that, that there is a kind of transhumanist is part of a transhumanist um, push. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm an I'm an old humanist in that sense. I'm very against this technophilic new man machine thing. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> this flat world. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm gonna read Adam's question. Nina. Um, <laughs> okay, Nina. Do you feel we are entering a first generation of women in history? where they have been coupled with the option, gentle push, to focus on career, the rise in technology, online dating, hookup culture, and modern contraception. Is there now an issue of current and future generations that do not have children and are entering a time in their lives where the decision is not so easy to make? Biologically, hookup swipe culture, haven't met someone they connect with, et cetera. Maybe even the pandemic now halting time for some potentiality. Thanks. Yeah, no, um, totally. I, I think, yeah, this is the largest long scale um, experiment in uh, certainly ma women's mass entry into the workforce and the encouragement, particularly among middle class women, um, of uh, the idea that you can like have it all, I suppose, the idea of having a, a career and a family. Um, you can see why that was uh, pushed as a kind of liberating uh, model. Um, in many ways it is. Of course, when women have economic independence, things are radically different. I don't think it's the culmination of feminism. In my book from ages ago, 2009, I argued very much against that the emancipation of women culminates in them being good capitalist workers. You know, I think that's not what feminism uh, is. I, I, I wish that we lived in a culture that was much more honest about how actually difficult it is to do both of those things. And that actually there are very, very hard choices. As I said before, that's why I made it personal about the decision not to have children. It's something I thought about for a long time. You know, I, that, that, that it's a very, very big question. And, you know, if we don't have a society that's able to deal with those kinds of strange losses like the loss of something that doesn't happen or that the you know even a kind of um, question of tragedy let's say you know of not getting what you want because we live in a society that basically tries to say you can always get what you want you know or that's that's good it's good to get what you want you know you can buy things you can you know and that's obviously in tension with the reality of probably most people's lives in in one respect or another you know and so <sighs> yeah, I I think there should be a more honest discussion about this for what, what it means for women. I, I think it, it, it would be cruel. I think it's a cruel culture that pretends that you can get what you want and you can have it all when that's obviously not going to be the case for a lot of people. And I, I, I think neither basically should be, if women choose to not work and to have children, if they're able to economically, or if women choose to work instead and not have children or whatever, or choose to do nothing is the third option. I quite like the idea of feminism of failure where you literally fail at everything. Like you don't have a family, you don't have children, but you also don't have a job. I mean, that's kind of like <laughs> also a possibility, right? It's like, you, you don't just not have it all. You don't have anything. It's great. Um, but yeah, so I, I yeah, I, I just think it's very tough and it, and, and if even when p women go to university, I think it should be kind of encouraged to, that women should think about about this question if they want to have children. That it's that it's uh, they should be thinking about it carefully. Yeah, definitely. Ursula, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes. Again, uh, I mean, this is such a huge topic. It's really <laughs> difficult to 
narrow it down or focus, but uh, to me somehow this government control thing and sex um, had part of it because you, you in the beginning you compared it with revolution. Um, is As we are now, let's say we're kind of male dominated both in government and in religion, I mean all these churches, there are some exceptions, but they're still minor. Isn't, my question is, if it's probably partly this control um, issue of sexual behavior and what is moral okay and ethically and what isn't all of these regulations and rules and even all the, the unconscious uh, values that come from that does that possibly come from the male and I'm just putting it as a quite blunt as the male uh, fear of the female power basically because we know feminine female orgasm is huge yeah i mean it's such a power just this way i mean there are so many pictures of i don't know the sea the waves whatever you want to call it maybe it there is a connection um between trying to control this huge power that and in a way it's the craving also yeah i mean we all want that togetherness we want that huge energy but then it's the distribution of who can have it and then it becomes the product stuff that we don't find so nice so did, do you get what i mean the yeah no t totally i think it's a really interesting and like, positive question i mean i think it's it yeah i mean i would like to think in a way that there's this kind of um huge sort of re resource of like female power and energy in a way and and you know again it's like why does the clitoris exist like there is this thing you know that's purely devoted to this one uh thing and um you know again it's sort of weirdly under research still uh what's going on there uh somehow and um you know i mean i, th I think yeah that i don't know how to put it it's i think you're right that a lot of um the organization the historical organization of society is about the fear in many ways of female sexual power, um, of female sexual energy. Of course, look at the way in which women have been demonized for being sexual historically, and that there is a way in which the control of female bodies is not just about reproduction, it's not just about um, patriarchy in the sense of the patriarchal lineage. You know, it's like, of course, there in that model, then the woman belongs to the man and the children then belong to the man because it's a question of inheritance. You know, and of course that that in a way functions very well in a particular society in which you want to preserve property ownership. And I think that's the question that's coming up in some of the other comments as well. It's about how how to have a non-propertyless relation to children or to to sex. And it, I think obviously that was one of the promises of the sexual revolution. You know, and I, it's easy now to look back and criticise aspects of the sexual revolution, but also to understand what people were thinking positively was to break was of course to break with these models of property and to and possessiveness and you know and in the name of discovering or experimenting with this awesome power you know and and the for the second wave feminists too m vast majority were really thinking about this how to kind of um uh preserve and protect and explore female pleasure and female desire you know and again that's an unfinished project i think the second wave is an unfinished project and something else has happened since then um, to kind of commodify feminism as well, which I'm very kind of critical of. Great. Um, let me see. Do we, did I miss any questions here? I'm trying to write one really fast, but I could just ask it. <laughs> yeah, jump in here, Laura. Okay, so my question is, um, do you have any thoughts about the Western lineage of sacred sexuality? Because um, I've been thinking about this and tracking, um, you know, the turn towards Tantra and Taoism. And when we think about what, what might be emergent or the next possibility for a Western sexuality that is rooted in something larger um, you know, maybe agape that, yeah, so, so the question is, yeah, just your thoughts on that and how seems like there could be more of a guiding principle that is not necessarily rooted in traditional religion. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there are like resources to draw on. I mean, I guess the people who explore the kind of power of sex in a certain way in, in the maybe some of the ways you're suggesting would be like kind of left hand path magic people, you know, the, the idea of um, sex magic and the kind of um, using the force and energy um, for particular ends in a way or, or trying to harness and understand desire so that you're not the kind of victim of it in a way also and I think when you read um, uh, people like uh, Giordano Bruno in the Middle Ages, you know, he has some incredibly interesting things to say about bonding and, and uh, desire and that actually to manipulate people is to control their desire, basically. I mean, again, this goes back to the politics of it. So the person who is in control of their own desire, basically, has a kind of magical control of themselves, you know, and that they're able to deploy desire. Again, like the androgyne, I think we also mentioned this very alchemical symbol the, the androgyne is incredibly important for it because he or she is the one who can kind of manipulate everyone's desires because everybody desires the androgyne, whether they are, you know, a gay man or a straight man or a straight woman or, you know, because because they're attractive, they because they're, they're, they're the chameleonic desirable object, everybody desires them and therefore they kind of have this power. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think in practice, I guess, what used to be called new age stuff, you have a kind of um, amalgamation of let's say like Eastern um, ideas with kind of perhaps some pagan or magic traditions, you know, it's like a mixture of things. But I definitely think if you, you know, there's things to draw on in the kind of the strictly Western tradition, although a lot of the sex magic people are obviously looking to the, the East as well and, and Tantra and yoga. So I, I think they're probably like uh, indissociable at this point, you know, like the, all those traditions, because in a way they're always subterranean traditions because they're always, you know, they're never the dominant one, you know, they're never the, the church is always obviously against these, these ideas. Cool. Uh, great. Uh, sorry, I was like, are you gonna do a follow-up, Flora? You look like you kind of maybe were going to. <laughs> no, okay, that's, that's great. Um, okay, so Nina, what do you think? Final thoughts, words, publications? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I hope, I hope like that was uh, good. That was good for you all too. <laughs> um, I, I tried to have a group discussion on sex once at the um, uh, R.D. Lang's Institute in London, the Philado Philadelphia Association, because um, we were having sort of an encounter group type thing that I tried to set up and um, the sex discussion went like so horribly badly wrong that we could never run the group again and somebody <laughs> thought it was too soon for the group to have sex and, uh, and I I agree that, that that happened but um so yeah I think I think it was it was very interesting and, and thank you for the sort of polite and wide-ranging and and but also you know deep and honest um points and questions that people were making and I think all of these topics are perennial and and in a way not discussed with the honesty that is um perhaps required. Great. And can you tell us a little bit about what's coming next week? Um, yes, okay. So the final um, topic is on men and women. And this is really what my book ended up being about. So this idea of heterosociality, which is the idea that we live in a mixed world, um, that men and women encounter each other all the time, not primarily in a sexual way, but just in an everyday kind of way that we kind of have to live together, basically, whether we like it or not, very few of us can be separatists in any meaningful sense. Um, so it goes towards what I was saying actually about the kind of um, the reconciliation point, you know, what happens after the revolution and the terror, this, the third stage, you know, what, what are the kind of positive possibilities basically for all kinds of male, female relationships, friendship, um, romantic relationships, marriage and, and so on. So it's kind of just going a bit deeper into how men and women could pace, basically against an, of, an often really hostile media, you know, that's often trying to describe men as kind of toxic and, you know, and that, that, that actually really encourages a kind of resentment between the sexes. So I'm, it's, it's like, how do we get beyond the resentment, you know, even where some of it might be, um, you know, righteous, that, that to a kind of higher state of being collectively together so that we can enjoy our lives <laughs> more. That's great, beautiful. And uh, thank you so much for bringing these ideas to us. It's amazing. Um, 
and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Yeah, um, thank you, Peter. Yay. And of course. Everyone else. <laughs> Great. So um, we'll transition to talking about some upcoming events. And Amy, do you want to talk to us about what event you're leading soon? That oh, has to well, do with since, since Nina um, mentioned this documentary, TFW No GF, um, we are actually doing a screening and Q&A with the director on December 5th at 8 p.m., I believe. So I would love to see you guys all there because the film is absolutely amazing. And I think that you will have, the director, Alex, will have a lot of interesting insight into her topic. So I hope Excellent. to see you there. Excellent. Can you say what the acronym means? Oh, it's it's based on a meme, um, and it's that feel when no girlfriend. Cool. <laughs> Great. That seems really awesome. Uh, and then, of course, you can always visit the stoa.ca to see what other types of events we have going on. Maybe one that relates to working on like this, the kind of anima animus sexual integration uh, is Shadow Play with Aaron Rogerson and Alyssa Polizzi, which is happening every Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. That's one of our Wisdom Gym recurring events. And yeah, there's a lot of great things coming up. Redesigning regenerative cultures uh, with Daniel Christian Wall is happening soon, 23rd at noon Eastern time, and a bunch of other exciting, interesting events here at the Stella. And with that, thank you everybody for being here today. It was a pleasure as always. And I look forward to seeing you all in the future.